I'm going to tell you a story today about today's job market paradox. I think we have quite a lot of leaders here in the room. Um, we probably all have a lot of people that we need to hire for our teams. Uh, and today's labor market is actually a very interesting labor market because at one hand, we still have a fundamental issue of discrimination, but at the other hand, there's a huge talent shortage that keeps every recruitment team awake at night. So my story is around that paradox. Is there a way to solve that paradox? And I think there is, but the disclaimer is you might not really like the solution in the first place. I was um, born in a really good family. I mean, I'm white, I'm born in the Netherlands. Um, my dad, who's also here today, by the way, always had a good job. So I never had to worry about buying clothes, going to study, the things that I would consider to be normal, but are not normal for everyone. And the two things that always triggered me in my life, and so I don't know why, because life never treated me unfairly, or not really unfair, is unfairness and situations that are not logical. I think that showed for the first time when I was 11 or 12 years old. Uh, because when I was 11 years old, I went to high school together with my twin sister Fleur, who is also my co-founder, by the way. Um, and back then we were very small. Well, I'm still pretty small, but a little bit smaller back then. Um, we bought a huge bag for our books, and then, of course, at the first day, if you go to high school, then you pack, pack, pack all your books, and um, at the second day, you realize, okay, you don't have to do that. Uh, but on the first day, we did. So we cycled to school, like 20 minutes. And when we arrived at that school, there was a, a guy named Richard. Uh, it was a black, a black man, 50 years old, something like that. And he was the school janitor. And what he basically did every day is he made sure that everyone could stall their bikes, but he also fixed your locker. And uh, maybe the most important thing uh, that applied to me, that applied to my twin sister Fleur, but I think to every single student there, he made us feel very safe and at home. And I mean, I, a lot of you probably have kids. If they go to high school, that can be quite scary, right, on the first day. And Richard was there to make it a bit more pleasant for people on that first day. Um, so the first uh, day that we arrived, he saw Fleur and me uh, on the bike. Uh, and he found out that we were twins, and he started calling us Tweelingelingen, basically for the English translation, twins, twins. And since that day, every day when we arrived at school, he was screaming like, oh, there are the Tweelingelingen, and then he, packed, uh, he picked our uh, bikes and made sure that we could get in. So we became sort of friends. Let's say, let's say we were friends. Um, and then, I think six months after we started at that school, uh, all the students received an email um, saying that Richard would be gone the next month. His job had become redundant. Well, I didn't believe that, and I, up until today, I still don't believe that. Because he did have a function in that school, but I think that, apart from the practical things that he did, maybe the social function that he had for all the students was even more important than that. So, Fleur and me, 11 years old, um, were cycling back home and said to each other, this doesn't make sense, right? This is unfair and it's not logical, what happens here? We were at a school with, I think, 1,200 students, something like that. Uh, and in one night, we organized a strike the next day at school. We started, by the way, at 8 a.m. in the morning, and school started at 8.30, so we did start the strike before we actually had to go to class. Um, but we, we stayed there all day with every single student. There was not even one student going to a class. Until Richard could stay, well, we wrote a couple of news channels, newspapers, we even made it to Dutch television, and at the end of the day, the school just had to say, okay, he can stay, because then at least people are going to their classes next day. So he could stay, uh, and he stayed for quite a long time, I think a year before I left high school, up until a year before I left high school he stayed. Uh, but then history repeated itself, so after a couple of years, he again received the news. You're redundant, so you have to leave. So mission failed to some extent. 
Now, why am I telling this story? Um, I think that this story is the perfect example of the paradox that I just introduced. Richard is, I think, still up until today, I haven't seen him for a while, but was the most pleasant, motivated, grateful employee that I've ever, ever come across. In a job, let's be fair, a janitor, most of us don't want to have that job, or maybe even look down on a job like that. But he loved his job, and he got fired, and he wasn't able to find a new job again. And I think that's a perfect example of discrimination. Now, today, a lot of schools have problems to hire a janitor. Well, Richard could have done that job, actually, for them. So, um, we are talking about, I think, 2013, when this happened. And you would hope, then, that by today, something has changed. But unfortunately, that's not true. Because the labor market is still a place that is not fair for a lot of people. Over 50% of all applicants in the Netherlands experienced discrimination, at least once, or felt discriminated. And if you look at unemployment rates for black people versus white people, still black people are much more unemployed than white people. And last but not least, uh, this is uh, research I found quite recently, which really surprised me, by the way. Um, over 80% of all people with autism globally are unemployed at the moment. And the weird thing about that is that people with autism are on average 1.4 times more productive than neurotypical people. So it doesn't really make sense. Now, I now have a tech company, uh, but before I started this company, my twin sister and I had a recruitment agency together. So I got the opportunity to basically experience recruitment in a lot of different companies, a lot of different contexts. And we experienced the, the weirdest examples of discrimination. We literally had board members of big Dutch companies calling us, saying like, a woman in her early 30s don't want her as a manager, she's going to have kids, she's going to work part-time. That's not something that we want here. We even had a, a, a guy calling us, again, I can't mention the name, but a really big Dutch company who said, someone with a difficult name, that's not probably going to work out very well here. So you might want to look for someone else. Those are just a few of the examples that we came across. So it's discrimination is really there. Now, um, the paradox has two sides, of course, of the story. So what is interesting about today's labor market is that discrimination is not the only problem that we are facing, because we are also facing a talent shortage at the same time. I re even read the news yesterday saying, like, okay, we would have thought that a lot of people would be fired now because of the economic downturn, but it's actually not happening because companies really fear that they can't find people anymore after that. The UN actually recently published an article saying that they predict that we have almost 100 million fewer people in the labor force by 2050. So that's quite a lot. And um, at the same time, due to all the new innovations and technologies, there's a demand for 20 million extra jobs in the coming years. So that is going to be a conflicting issue. But I think there's a way to solve this paradox that we are facing. But before I go to the solution, I first want to go to the problem, because I think that that's the starting point. And you might not like the root cause of what is happening in today's labor market, but it's actually you. You are the root cause of what's happening today. Now, um, so I have a tech company and I have a science team within my company, so my head of science um, helped me explain what basically happens in our brains. To give you a small crash course, um, if we look at our brains, if we look at what's happening on a daily life, now you are viewing me and I'm viewing you, and every single second, our brain is confronted with 11 million pieces of information. And out of these 11 million pieces of information, we can only process 40 consciously. At the same time, we make over 35,000 decisions on a daily basis. That's a lot. That's almost undoable. So how we do that is 
our brain finds patterns. But when we apply that to human beings, those patterns are normally usually wrong. To give you an example, how many of you did go to university? And how many of you think that going to university means you're smart? I don't believe that. <laughs> That's not true. Um, we still think that if you went to university, that's, uh, that's, that basically tells you how intelligent people are. So if we see a resume of someone and it says they went to Nairobi, maybe, we think they're probably smart, because otherwise you probably wouldn't make it here anyways. Now, the thing is that we think that people with a university background are smart because we've always been told that that's the case. But if you look up research, and I'm sorry for Nairobi University, I'm not saying, by the way, that you shouldn't go studying, but don't do it because you think you're smart then, uh, because research shows that there's no correlation. There's no correlation between your educational level and your level of intelligence. Another example, how many of you do hire people? That's quite a lot. Um, imagining hiring someone for a sales position. How many of you would hire an introverted person for a sales position? No one. One. Yeah, but you know more than that. <laughs> okay. How many people would hire an extroverted person for a sales position? Okay, well, that's uh, a bit more at least. That's also wrong. You don't have to be extroverted in order to be good for a sales job. In fact, research has shown that introverted people are better at listening, and a good salesperson listens more than they talk. And you're good at finding connections in people's stories, make a judgment of, hey, are we capable to help you, yes or no? But because we've always been told that salespeople need to be some sort of extroverted sales tigers, hunters, all those horrible terms that we use for that, um, that we now only look for extroverted salespeople. And these are just some examples of labels, patterns that our brain has made. Every, a every a year on International Women's Day, you have that picture on LinkedIn with a CEO and a nurse, and then you see a male CEO and a female nurse. Now, I am a CEO myself, but if I would envision a CEO, then I would still think about a guy over a woman. That's not because I think uh, men are better CEOs, by the way. Um, in fact, I think it's the other way around. Um, but the reason I think that is because I've just seen more CEOs. Like, my dad is a CEO, so I've, I've been growing up with the idea that a CEO is a male figure. Now. Enough examples, um, but I think you can see what I, where I'm going to. Because of the fact that we have to process so much information on a daily basis, our brain the only thing that our brain is doing is finding patterns, linking that to each other, and making sure that you can just understand the world around you. But if you apply that to a hiring setting, then usually that's not the best idea. And that's where technology comes in. Uh, because technology is a bit, big topic, of course, for today, thinking upside down. Because the one thing between, the one big difference between technology and human beings, if you build technology the right way, by the way. I know that there are a lot of examples of AI not being the best version or not the version that you would wish for. But if you build technology the right way, the one big difference between our human brain and technology, is that with technology, you can control the patterns that they are creating. We do the same in our company. We apply neuroscience to get to know applicants, basically. But the statistical models behind that, we control those models. And we also look for inconsistency so that we can adjust it a little bit. But you will never be able to control your brain. It's just undoable. Look at those numbers. You just can't do that. 
So the solution of the paradox that we are facing today is not human beings, I'm sorry. I know that we would have wished to be able to make the right decisions, be fair for everyone, etc. But it's technology. I think there's incredible talent out there. Everyone has, is unique, everyone has talents. Richard definitely had a lot of talents. I mean, if he would apply to my company, I would probably hire him right away. So everyone is talented, but we just have to see it. And our brain is not always capable of doing that, but technology can actually be. So maybe my takeaway for today's, today's talk to you, don't always try to fix every problem in the world yourself, but sometimes do accept some help from things around you, people around you. And in this case, technology can make sure that these two contradictions, because that's the most interesting part, discrimination and talent shortage, sometimes if two problems cross each other at the right place and time, they turn out to be each other's solution. So, due to a talent shortage, we have to look beyond a resume or whatever. So, we have to make it a little bit more fair. But if we would stop discriminating people, then there also wouldn't be a talent shortage, because there is enough talent out there, we just don't see it. And that, I believe, is something that technology can solve. Thank you. <laughs>